What does your body feel like in zero gravity? What inspires you to become an astronaut? What exercise do you do? And do you sweat in space? What do yo-yo work in microgravity? So it works. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? is now ready for the event. Sea Education Association, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call the station for a voice check. Station, this is Sea Education Association. How do you hear me? Loud and clear, SEA. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. I'm Paul Joyce, Dean at Sea Education Association. I'd like to welcome everyone to SEA here in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Today, we're very pleased to have with us high school students who are enrolled in our Seascape summer program. They'll be asking questions, some of which were submitted by our Sea Semester college students while aboard our sailing school vessel, the SSV Corus Kramer. So without further ado, we'd now like to turn to our Seascape students for questions. Hi, um, here at SEA, we are learning about human-made pollutants that are tossed into the ocean like a trash dump. Most often, this pollution never disintegrates. Could you tell us about debris and trash in space and what the International Space Station does to avoid colliding with it? Is it possible to get rid of the debris or will it remain in orbit forever? Yeah, we have, a, we have a similar problem here on the International Space Station. We have about, a, I guess, about a half a million objects uh, in low Earth orbit, which we consider to be debris. Uh, some of them man-made, some of them dust, some of them coming from outer space. Um, and about 20,000 of those, or a little bit over 20,000, are larger than a softball. So we're very aware of them and very concerned about them. And that, those are only the things we can track. Um, when we are worried about a collision, we, uh, we have to move the space station. And fortunately, we usually have advanced warning to help us get the space station in a good configuration and get it into the right uh, location in orbit uh, to avoid collisions uh, with, with any debris. Um, a lot of that debris will eventually uh, re-enter the atmosphere and burn up on re-entry. But there is, depending on its mass and drag, it could stay in orbit for a long, long time. to do any special scientific observation of the ocean that can only be done from space? We, uh, we have had external payloads over the course, over the course of the uh, International Space Station program which have, have looked at the ocean specifically. Uh, one thing that we are personally asked to do is uh, when there's an event happening either in land, uh, on land or at sea, uh, for instance, a volcanic eruption, uh, wildfires, and particularly at sea, large storm systems. Uh, we are asked to photograph those uh, because lots of times we have in, uh, immediate data about, about what's going on down on Earth. Thank you. Science at sea and science in space are both challenging in that gravity acts differently or not at all. What are lab and experimental work like in a microgravity environment? It, yeah, yeah it, rem, it reminds me of uh, being in lab on the westward when you had a really nice sea swell. Um, it is uh, hard to keep track of equipment up here in a microgravity environment. People ask what is, uh, the mo what's easier to do in space, and I think there are two things, uh, uh, float and move heavy, heavy things around. Ever, other than that, um, most of our experiments, we try to account for uh, what it's, the environment is like up here, but if you set something down, and turn your back, and air current's going to take it, and it's going to float away. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just something you have to get used to and plan for as you're uh, taking on the task, uh, much like when you're at sea, and we also design special equipment, much like we do at sea, to, to help, us, uh, help us perform those experiments up here safely. Thank you. Does the color of the ocean from space vary with the concentration of marine life? 
Yeah, that's a, you know, it's interesting. There's definitely variety in the ocean colors. I was telling someone the other day, uh, flying over, I can almost right now uh, tell when we're over the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean's a little harder to discern, but clearly flying over the Atlantic versus the Pacific, just because the, the color and texture of the water somehow seems different to me. Um, clearly, you know, we can see uh, reef, building, uh, when reef building organisms, their work very clearly from orbit. And, uh, and around those reef systems, the uh, water color changes. For things like uh, algal uh, events and algal blooms, probably not as much. Um, it's kind of hard to discern from, from when you have like a, hard, a sediment runoff or heavy sediment runoff, which is also very, very obvious up from up here, particularly after a flooding event. adjustments to microgravity that are comparable to getting sea legs, such as getting space legs. Do you have any fun stories to share about the adjustments? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, it, it, it takes a few days at sea uh, to, get, to get used to uh, the motion of the ship. And uh, mo almost all of us go through that f during space flight. Uh, you can have a lot of the same symptoms, dizziness, uh, nausea, um, just kind of general fatigue and malaise, that kind of feeling you get, maybe your first uh, 48 hours on, on, on board a ship. Same thing, arriving to low Earth orbit, getting used to microgravity. Um, and most of us go through it. And those of us who don't go through it on the front end, we also have to reacclimatize to getting back on Earth, which is also a big adjustment. And that was one of the hardest adjust adjustments for me on my last mission. Not so much arriving up here, but going home and getting used to that, that weight. My head was spinning. I kind of felt dizzy and, and nauseous and uh, very similar to, uh, you know, those wonderful experiences we have, we have at sea sometimes. time off our planet changed the way you lead your life here on Earth, either generally or specifically? We uh, live on a, a remarkable planet, and uh, from up here, you clearly understand, I know we all know this intellectually, but when you look down on it, uh, the, our Earth from here, it's, um, you get a real sense of we, we're all in this together. And uh, much like a crew on a sailing ship or a crew on the space station, you're looking down at Earth and you kind of view it, it's really just a large space station. And we're all sharing the same resources. Uh, we are all subject to the same, uh, the same in, uh, kind of closed environment. Um, you, you just get a sense for, you know, we're, all, we're kind of all, all on this spaceship together, all as one crew. And, you know, we really got to work together to protect it. What is one misconception about space that people have that you would like to correct? I'm sorry, you dropped out a minute. Could you repeat the question? What is one misconception about space that people have that you would like to correct? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this this is not always the glamorous job that people make it out to be. Uh, it, it, much like when if you tell someone you're going to go live on a on a, a sailing ship for two weeks or six weeks or several months, um, uh, people always have this picture in your mind like you're laying in the deck in the sun and just enjoying you know enjoying being at sea. But you know when the head breaks, it's always going to be on a Sunday morning at four o'clock in the morning when the, you can't find the equipment under the worst sea state you can imagine. And it's the same thing up here. Um, there's a, there, it's a self-contained environment, and you're responsible for every aspect of it, just like caring for caring for a ship. There are moments of it which are just pure magical, just like pure magic, just like at sea. But um, there are parts of the job that are just not terribly glamorous. What are some experiences you had with SEA that you feel prepared you for life on the ISS? Oh, there's nothing I've done in my life that prepared me better for my experience up here. Shipboard life uh, aboard a sailing vessel is uh, just a very similar to our day-to-day -day operations up here. Working on science stations, taking care of your vehicle, uh, thinking ahead to what's coming next, um, dealing with, with contingencies. 
Uh, that whole exp and, and working together as a crew uh, with a bunch of people in a confined space. I, I don't think there's anything I've done in my life that prepared me better for this. And interestingly, when I interviewed for this job as an astronaut, I, I only did a, uh, two cruises with SEA. And um, so they weren't very long. One was I did a three-month stint and then a couple weeks one summer. And during my interview to become an astronaut, that was the thing that people asked me the most questions about on the interview panel, well, about my life at sea and, and how that prepared me for the, my perceptions of, of how this job would be. Thank you. On the ISS, are the research, research efforts slash projects country specific or is all the research overarching and being worked on by all countries? It's a little bit of both. We like to say we're off the earth for the earth, and everything we do up here will make its way down to everyone. Uh, but some of the some of it's a collaborative uh, across many countries. In fact, the whole International Space Station is collaborative. I'm coming to you from the J uh, Japanese built model, which I use all the time. I'm looking right into the European module, uh, where my colleague uh, Alex Gerst from Germany is working. Uh, that was built by a consortium of European countries, and of course, you have the U.S. segment and then the Russian segment. And uh, it's very collaborative. There, there are science projects that are done specifically within, uh, you know, a specific country, and even uh, within a specific commercial entity. But the idea is, all the work we do up here is to either prepare ourselves for uh, for future exploration of the solar system and to better life on Earth. Thank you. What aspects of Earth life do you miss most while on the ISS? Um, just like a, a long cruise at sea, it'd be your family, you know, just your family and friends. Uh, one thing that is clearly different from, from life at sea is uh, you really miss the weather. Um, you know, the, the weather's perfect inside the space station uh, every single day, but uh, I really wouldn't mind uh, this, just the sound of rain. Maybe not up here, but down on Earth, the sound of rain or a, or a thunderstorm. In reading about the ISS, I see that a lot of experimental work is about how the human body responds to being in space. How do astronauts feel about being their own test subjects? What changes, if any, have you noticed with your own body while in space? Yeah, it, it comes with the job. You're a test subject from the minute you uh, become an astronaut, so you kind of get used to it. And, uh, you know, there, there's a... Uh, uh, I'd like to think the work we're doing up here is is preparing our, our preparing this human species for going out into the solar system. And uh, if the data I'm able to provide by being here helps us accomplish that goal, then I'm really happy and proud to be a part of it. Um, specifically for me, um, I haven't really noticed any changes specifically. I have noticed that uh, it's very common for our, for our eyeballs to change shape a little bit, and you have adjustments in your vision. And I have noticed that uh, since I've arrived back in March. Um, I would expect that when I go back to planet Earth and get subjected to all the testing there, they will also probably notice that some of the bone structure has changed a little bit. I think, uh, you know, crystals just form differently up here, and our bones are just crystalline, cr crystalline objects. And so uh, I expect that my bone density will be about the same, but my structure might be a little bit different. And then there's things we don't know. There are the things that they're going to figure out. Maybe, you know, long after I'm done flying in space, they'll have a data set of uh, several years of human exploration up here and uh, be able to figure out some of the other changes that have happened. Thank you. For those who have had multiple trips to the ISS, what is it like readjusting to life on Earth? Uh, my, one of my colleagues up here uh, said the curse of being an astronaut is uh, whenever you're on Earth, you want to be in space, and as soon as you get, whenever you're in space, you want to be back on, on Earth. Um, my, my first trip home was very humbling. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're having this unbelievable experience. Uh, we came up and helped build the space station. You kind of, we arrived to, you know, a bit of a hero's welcome, and... Uh, and then you get to your house and, you know, the, the shutter still needs to be repaired. The grass still needs to be mowed. And two days after landing, I am sitting in a parking lot at Target thinking, uh, did that really just happen? You know, did I just really come back from, from outer space? And I expect that will be a very similar, <laughs> similar experience this time, uh, with the exception that this is a much longer trip. 
I'll be up here for about seven months, so there's going to be some reintegration with my family and friends and just the daily routine that's probably going to take a little bit more getting used to. Thank you. What do you bring with you to the station, both physical and non-physical, to remind you of home? I have uh, I've, I have a few things I flew for my family that I that I have with me. Um, we're not allowed to bring a whole lot up here because getting stuff to space is hard. Uh, I have a lot of pictures of uh, family and friends uh, that ha I have brought with me and that have also been sent up to me. Um, and and those are really nice because there's pick moments in time that I can reflect upon and you know you have your memories which uh, you carry with you and, and they don't weigh a lot so I'm allowed to bring as many as I can carry. Um, but those, those things are, uh, you know, really important, and it's going to be even more important as we head out into deep space. How do we keep people, uh, uh, how do we maintain a sense of connection to, to home? Thank you. What's the first thing you plan to do when you come back to Earth? Uh, hug my family and, uh, and maybe eat a, a, a really nice pizza. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think the scientific knowledge and background you gained from SCA helps you on the ISS today? Yeah, I think I alluded that uh, to that earlier. Um, there's just so many similarities. I reflect upon it a lot while I'm here. Um, and in fact, one of the things I'm reading up here is the, the Aubrey Maturin series uh, by Patrick O'Brien you know, about working on uh, you know, sailing ships in the Royal Navy. Um, not that uh, we have all the, the, <laughs> the life of a member of the Royal Navy. Uh, the floggings are kept to a minimum up here. But uh, it's just a uh, similarity to those, those long, long journeys at sea um, uh, kind of uh, remind me of uh, what we're doing up here. And uh, surely I think that helped prepare me for, for my life and experiences up here. Thank you. Are there any traditions, idioms, ways, or lore that have developed during our time exploring space that gets passed down among astronauts? Sure, there's a lot of traditions. Uh, in fact, one of the traditions here, the first American on the International Space Station was in the Navy. So we actually have a ship's bell up here. Um, when we launch uh, vehicles out of Florida, um, and Russians, of course, have their own traditions that are all very, uh, go all the way back to Yuri Gagarin. And whatever Yuri Gagarin did on his first flight, we, we actually carry some of those traditions with us to this day. Um, in Florida, the, one of the traditions, uh, uh, and my, this is something my family took part in, was... Uh, they eat uh, cornbread and beans and um, after a successful launch. And, and that's just, I guess it, it was, that happened after some launch early in history, and that's been carried forward. So uh, we have a lot of those same uh, traditions that you, that you ha learn at sea. Thank you. How does NASA help connect their personnel to the history of space travel? We, we actually have a history office, and um, one of the interesting things they do is they actually bring in people and, and record, um, you know, just record their memories. And, and what was it like building the first spacesuit? What was it like? How did you come up with the idea to get to the moon? How did you come up with the idea that we're going to, you know, actually do a, a, a docking and rendezvous on the moon? Um, and because those things are easily lost, we're a kind of fast-moving agency. Uh, we are always focused on the next horizon, and it's very easy to lose, uh, lose those lessons that were learned. So our history office does a really good job of, uh, of trying to archive that stuff. And, of course, as, uh, as, uh, as astronauts and flight directors and, and uh, the, the flight, flight control team, you know, all the people on the ground, you know, it's very important for us. We've learned some hard lessons in this business because it's a dangerous business, and it's really important we don't forget them. What are some ways you capture your experiences, photos, drawing, writing, etc., to share the beauty and uniqueness of space with people who likely will never go there? Would you be willing to share some examples? 
I can uh, definitely share share some examples, and it's a huge obligation of ours to share this experience with people, in, in my opinion. And so, uh, I, I have never been much of a photographer, but I've been uh, taking a lot of pictures up here. I've been posting them on uh, both my Instagram and, and uh, Twitter accounts uh, at Astro underscore Ricky. Um, uh, almost on a daily basis so that's one way that I can you know hopefully carry people along on, on this journey because this is really a journey that uh, of you know a cast of millions made this possible and I'm just one of the lucky ones to get that gets to do it so I feel an obligation uh, to share it um, I also try to try to journal uh, and uh, that you know just important to kind of capture moments of the day so when I look back um, I can kind of reflect on you know this is what was important to me at that point in time and um, so, and I think that's kind of an important skill to have no matter what you do. Thank you. Traveling and experiencing life in challenging circumstances can really give one perspective and open one's mind. How has your perspective changed since you've lived in space? Well, you know, I, I've, I, I feel like I've been one of those people who's always been a team player. That's a lesson you learn as you, as you grow up, the importance of the team you're on. And uh, so that's certainly one lesson I'll carry from here. I'm, I'm part of a, a remarkable team both up here and, uh, and around the world that, that make all this happen on a daily basis at great personal sacrifice. This is an around-the-clock operation, and spaceflight doesn't really have holidays. It just goes and goes and goes. Um, I think the second thing is... Um, you know, just an obligation to share the perspective we have of uh, looking down on, on our remarkable planet. Um, you you really get a sense of a kind of a perspective of, of where we are uh, in the in the solar system, how precious uh, what we have is, and how we all need to to learn to share it and uh, get along. Uh, you hear people say who have had this experience, you know, when you look down, you just see this beautiful planet. You don't see borders. You don't see um, a lot of the things we bicker and argue about. And um, uh, I think that perspective is one that, that needs to be shared and, and heard over and over again. Thank you so much, Ricky. My pleasure. Are there any other questions? I think that's it for questions from here. And Ricky, I do want to thank you from everyone here at NCA. And it's a it's a long way making this communication today from the days of calling Mr. West or uh, Mr. West Mr. Wilson on Westward back in the day. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, I wish you all the best during your experience in, uh, in Woods Hole this summer. And, um, you know, I encourage you to, 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 to think about taking some of those challenges, challenging voyages that are offered in life and uh, enjoying that experience and, uh, and just testing yourself and, and see what you learn about yourself and about other people. It's a, re it's a remarkable opportunity, and I encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of it. All the best. And this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all participants from the Sea Education Association station. We are now resuming operational audio communications. Mm -hmm.